Hello. We are recording. So this is the June 30th, 2020 SIG release meeting. Um, this is a Kubernetes community meeting. We adhere to the Kubernetes code of conduct. The meeting is obviously being recorded, as I just mentioned, and we'll be posting it onto YouTube a little bit later. So please be mindful of the code of conduct and be good collaborative people here. So we have a number of things on the agenda. Um, it looks like Marky and Sasha and Phoenix, who I don't know and I don't see in the participants yet, but a number of people had dropped some stuff in the agenda. So um, I'll throw that in the Zoom chat, the link up. Oh, Marky already got it, awesome. And please put your name in the the attendees. That's handy for us to be able to understand who was here and follow the, the decision log and, and see who all was involved and, and reach out to others as needed to, to bring them into conversations and things like that. So I guess, first of all, I see a few names that I'm not super familiar with. Why don't we start with our welcome to any new folks attending? Anybody would like to introduce themselves? Hi, this is Tina Joe from AMP. Uh, I work at the ARCT4 support enablement on Kubernetes, together with my colleague, uh, uh, Bing Lu. And I put uh, some in the agenda to mainly ask to add ARCT4 initial support to Kubernetes. We have done some work. Anything else is missing? Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, welcome. And we'll cycle through that as we get to it on the agenda, yeah. Anybody else wanna say hi for the first time? Okay, turn on then. On sub-project updates, um, we, we haven't entirely been going through these each time. Licensing's been a bit stalled out. There was a little bit of chatter on Slack this week around it. I don't know if anybody's got an update on that. I'm guessing not. Okay. And release engineering for folks who are, are newer, we were alternating weeks. So this week is the overarching SIG discussion. And in the alternating weeks, we have a focus just on the release engineering topics. Um, so for the most part, I'll leave that, but we have one mention here around some release notes fix-ups. Um, Adolfo and Sasha, you want to talk about the, the process that we we're discussing with the PSC for that? Yeah, go ahead and say Which one? Either, either of you. <laughs> Do, do you want to start it, Adolfo? Because, yeah, so we, I can just give a short introduction. So we were talking about some possible enhancements to the release notes in the process at all. And because we had an ongoing cap, and this cap is mostly resolved, we have CREL release notes and some other tooling around, and we implemented many, many enhancements in the past weeks and months, which are now already used in production. But then we were th thinking about how we can improve the overall process. So our main idea was that we can somehow shift the overall release notes fixing period, which is right now at the end of the release cycle, more or less to, to be able to fix the release notes during the cycle. So to get early feedback on the release notes and that the people in SIG release and the release notes team have the possibility to fix up notes during the cycle. So, yeah, and Adolfo prepared a very nice demo, and we were going to solve that from a technical perspective by being able to map release notes from A to B. But Adolfo can show it to you right now, I think so. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we prepared a small de demo to show that. Let me see if I can share my, my screen. I, know I, I just can... turned you on as co-host, so if it fails, try again. Okay, and just okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, 
let me start by, uh, I'm going to generate the release notes for version 1, 18.1 here, uh, because I want to show something on that release, on that uh, patch release. So this is our standard uh, release notes for that patch version, which has around, I don't know, 20 or so changes. And uh, the idea here is that, uh, for example, we don't, let's say that we want to change things uh, before uh, code freeze. Uh, for example, I was thinking that maybe we instituted a policy of not allowing uh, things like, for example, here in this, in this note here, we had an LB creation. And let's say that we, uh, for some, for whatever reason, instituted a policy that we don't want to allow uh, like abbreviations at like this one. And we would like to change that. And maybe there's uh, no need. Uh, we would prefer not to, to have to chase the original PR authors to change the release notes and then regenerate. So um, the idea is that we can create uh, mapping files with the release note information to change that before uh, the actual, uh, b without needing the actual PR to be changed. Uh, so what we did is uh, we created uh, this concept of file, of mapping file, which has all of the, all of the release note information in there. And you can uh, change anything, any, any of the fields if you want. So for example, if I, if I want to change LB to, let's say load balancer before that, and uh, just uh, having, I can change any of the fields in theory. And um, let's say that I wanted, oh, so this is from another one. So I, uh, um, let's say that I want to change the author too. Or maybe I want to put myself in there for some Kubernetes fame. And um, I can just, uh, I can just save that piece of information and then um, do re regenerate the, the release notes uh, taking into account all of those uh, mapping files that that I can, uh, which I can use to modify the information. So uh, we have added a new flag to the release notes tool, which is this one here, uh, map from which currently reads a directory and search search for all of the YAML files that it finds in there, looking for this this pattern here. And if I uh, run that and regenerate the notes. It should uh, do that. Like that one. Oh, of course it didn't work. So, um, um, See which one did I? Well, it was supposed to change that one. Oh, and um, let's see. Oh, I, I remember now. So, sorry. It's, the thing is that since I'm running it on the RAM file system, it sometimes doesn't update the node. There it goes. Oh, it didn't change that again. Oh, well, the, the, well, the idea is that it, it's supposed to, to change that uh, to load balancer. I don't know, something, the demographics are not with me. Uh, so that's the first part of the, of the, of the demo. Okay, so um, maybe the next one will, will work. So the first one is uh, just updating, uh, uh, note information before uh, and having be, being able to change uh, information before uh, the release cycle is up and um, and then there's the next part which is um, a lot, um, uh, adding information to the release notes I don't know Sasha if you want to 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 take that part to the introduction to that one yeah, sure. 
So we had another request regarding not only changing release notes, but we also had a request that we want to add CVE information, which are under embargo until the release has been cut. And usually we would have a chance to actually solve the same issue the same way, but we would have the need for adding additional information and additional fields like the scoring of the CVE, the overall impact, a resolution and further information. And that way we had the idea to enhance the format, not only to be able to map release notes from A to B, but also to add some further, maybe security related information. And uh, so for that, uh, we have uh, another file format. Let me share again. Um, editor. Here it is. So this is uh, another file uh, which has. Um, so the thing I wanted to show the change of um, of changing version one eighteen dot one because if you see these uh, release notes here, this is the PR that fixes the recent CV vulnerability that was found in Kubernetes recently. So it has these release notes that it, that says reduce spam events during a volume operation error, which. Um, uh, it's it, it says that because the the since it's been fixed out in the open, they put another release note in there and another so that they can put up the code. But the the actual uh, vulnerability is not shown to the public. So the idea is that we can produce this sort of files here uh, that we can patch the notes with new um, with with a new text which uh, shows more of um more relevant information so this, this here is uh i'm changing the text to implement the changes to mitigate that vulnerability and then i'm changing the author to the product security committee i mean this is just a like a sample to, to demonstrate the thing and then if you see here i'm adding a new we're adding a new information to the release note this is a data field and um which is a adds the cv information to the release note uh, it adds like the proper title, the rating, the score that it was published, and the link PRs where where the vulnerability was fixed. And I sure that well, I mean, this is the actual description that that the security committee published. So the idea here is that I should be able to. And I'm not trusting my code anymore, but the idea here is that I should be able to um, rerun that. And uh, let me see if I just need to make sure I don't have the space in there. Okay, so if I run this one here and I re regenerate the notes for that revision, let's see if it works now, should pick up that information. And okay, th this one did work. So uh, it added the information of the, of the CB vulnerability uh, right here. So it's like a, a modification to the template we used to generate the release notes and now it includes all the information and um, uh, what what's I can have any of these mappings uh, mapping sources uh, to to be able to read from many sources. So the idea is that uh, the release team can work fixing release notes early and produce their own mapping directory and we can have other sources like a bucket or like a github repo where maybe the uh, security committee can publish this sorts of information that we can then incorporate as just as a proper time to release notes. And um, this is really nice. I, I, two, two really major benefits. The, the way that the release notes were sort of a last minute scramble that can now be amortized across the cycle more easily and more people can be brought in on, on given PRs. We can have patterns like, hey, you go look for all the LBs, let's change them to load balancer, be more descriptive for, for folks and spread, spread the work out, be more, more of a team on it more broadly. But then especially that frees us up at the last minute 
to deal with the emergencies instead of all the standard stuff and the emergency case of a security issue is a is a key one and this is a, a huge amount of nice flexibility the um another really nice benefit that we never had before in that regard is we'd slap the thing in it'd get committed somewhere or github would get updated we'd run the tool it would reap the thing this you can put the those mapping files locally see what they're going to look like what they're going to render like we've had all sorts of weird little rendering issues where a long message gets truncated or indentions weird like this you can know that 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 leading header that highlights the security issues is going to render nicely and all just tested locally on your machine push that yaml file and and go and and we know that we've got good release notes like the this is for for everybody on the call this pattern of testability is huge it's something we, we basically had almost none of a couple of years ago and as we're slowly nibbling away on each of these points to to have more testability it's it's making things so much more reliable and and safe it's not everything doesn't become run it in production so thank you this is this is great work all right thank you and the the meta issue here too also the one thing that i want to mention like a lot of people have said like release notes let's just automate that away but this highlights exactly why you can't do that. There's humans involved, there's choices. As we have a few thousand PRs in any release, what was mentioned for the release note might not be superhuman readable or comprehensible or is as accessible to the reader as we might desire to be really, really helping the broad community base out as they read them. So this getting the tools in place to automate the automatable parts but allow the humans to focus on making something that's really readable and high quality that's where i think we drive a special value instead of people just saying like automate those release people away like they they, they see that like we're actually doing a human curatorial task that adds a lot of value so thank you so speaking of release team um Next sub project is release team. Was that Taylor who was typing a, a little bit of updates in on that? Absolutely. So, uh, howdy, everybody. Happy Tuesday, I think it is. Uh, so, we are eight uh, weeks away from release week. Uh, I like how everything is going. We have a couple reds, a couple yellows, a couple greens, you know, all throughout our sys updates that we had yesterday, uh, but nothing too concerning. Um, we, uh, Stephen, myself, and, and Jeremy were talking late last night because we got on the topic of cherry picks and kind of some of the modifications that we've done in this release cycle. Uh, I know there have been quite a few. Um, one of them was around uh, fast forwards and cherry picks and kind of what the 1.20 release will look like going forward. Um, we're going to be opening that up. We're noodling that right now, but it looks like August 6th is going to be when that is opened up again. I uh, put some notes into the agenda. Basically, the thought was uh, fast forwards until RC2. Everything else is cherry picks, which is about one week of fast forwards and three weeks of cherry picks. Uh, and then have merge restrictions for roughly a month from code freeze branch cut to the cherry pick deadline. So uh, we're going to be getting some text together on that front and then uh, uh, sending that out to KDAV, and SIG release, and a couple other um, deals on that front. But uh, overall, looking good. Uh, very excited to see us getting closer to release and uh, very excited about KubeCon as well. But uh, any, any questions on that front? Something to mention, Stephen and I were, were wondering about shifting over to Go 115. And we sent an email. We just looked like on GitHub slash Golang slash Go if you tunnel into their releases, they have like, you can see the names of the people who've committed the releases. So we just sent an email to them yesterday like, hey, what's up with Go 115? We've heard it might be coming soon. Historically, it's been August, maybe into September. And they, they did let us know that it's at its earliest, it will be August 1st. So that, yeah. Always fun. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, we were we were kind of hoping like maybe hey COVID they they dialed back their um their content and hey it's into June they're finding the project done CI is green let's just ship it early, but they said and they they actually quoted somewhere in their their public release documents that they never release early. 
which is, is interesting <laughs> to know. And they, they also said we frequently release late. So we um, will have to figure out what we do, but if we get some better CI signal going on the Go tip, then we can at least have confidence that we're ready on master and potentially other branches to switch over. But I don't see us, we probably aren't gonna wanna switch to go 115 the week or two before release, but we've got a month basically to kind of set up CI and get some signal and make some choices, whether we, um, we aim for the 119.1 in September or if it feels like the risk is contained and CI is showing good, but we'll have to we'll have to figure that out on the fly in the next month, two months. Absolutely. So maybe that shifts us, shifts us over if there aren't any other release specific questions, but CI signal was next on the list. Hey, I, I don't have uh, any major update for today other than that I'll be giving the status update tomorrow um, for the first time. Um, so I have to uh, I have to reach out to Dan. I don't know how he does it. It's a big job. Um, it's a little bit daunting, but uh, I'll be doing that tomorrow. Um, we, we have a few changes um, coming in on CI infrastructure that we're expecting to um, fix some jobs. And uh, so... I'll, I'll give detailed reports on that tomorrow. And congratulations on and being the one who's going to do that because like that's that's part of what shadowing is about. Absolutely, yeah. Looking Figuring out all the things. Yeah. And I just pulled up um, test grid currently. I had been worried about the conformance one, and we actually have a green conformance run this morning after having been red consistently for quite a while. So that is a positive sign on those inbound fixes. Yeah, the, the, yeah there's, there's a few changes there that I've been kind of looking at for the first time today. You know, I'm just trying to really what I'm trying to do is um, uh, for this run, we've allocated jobs out um, uh, to we've allocated the jobs out so I'm keeping an eye on a few jobs. So now my, my, my eyes are cast across all of the jobs and preparing that update tomorrow. And I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm trying to get verb working in space max so that I can try and semi-automatically pull down data from test grid. But, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get it working, which I'll, I'd say will be a week or two, you know. Since we've got a couple of kind of bigger things on the agenda, I'm going to skip over new issue review and project board review for the moment and see if we get back around to it, which I'm sure like Lori's cringing, like this is why we always have a big backlog because we, we oh, don't no, get to it, but sorry. it's, yeah, well, let's, let's see what we get to in the next 34 minutes. Um, so Migrating Kubelet from Hypercube. I know this is something that Stephen was talking about, but I'm not sure who else was involved. Is there anyone like who wants to talk? One. I like this one, the agenda. So can you even hear me? Hope so. You're a little quiet for me. I don't know about for others. Well, in here. But... Yeah, we're quiet here too. Well, I can see. Is it better now? Still just a I, little bit quiet. Yeah. Okay, I will try to be a little bit louder, but so I will be quick. So the idea was we have images, images for all the other stuff that are in Hypercube, but the problem is that we don't have any image for Kubelet. And I was wondering like what we, how we, how we should advise folks to move from Kubelet uh, from Hypercube Kubelet to running Kubelet? Like, should it be run directly? Should folks build the image themselves? Should folks use, should we provide some images? And I have got a response that we should see with Signode. And I'm going to send an email to both Signode and SigRelease at upcoming days to bring up this topic. Because Dims told me that the running Kubelet in containers is deprecated. So let's see a little bit so to get a formal response from Signal, and then we can see if there is anything we can do about this. So that's mostly it from that. I have forgot to update that section, but there's... Uh, 
We don't have a quality decision making process around this type of thing. It's been a, a recurring question across all the artifacts. Which of the binaries, which of the RPMs, DEBs, which of the containers should we be making? What should their contents be? How how broad or narrow and how many different variations? And they, whether supported or deprecated, not supported, or sort of hobby-wise, best case available, we've we've not had a, a serious matrix of commitment and, and backing for that. So yeah, I'm, I'm really curious on this one because it's Signode, what preferences they have and and if there's um, any technical concerns that they have, like what what's the rationale for it being deprecated? Was it, or the benefits of Hypercube? Are there things that we're just not aware of? So yeah, that'd, that'd be a really interesting email thread to start. Um, Marco saying his Zoom crashed at some point. I think it felt like we heard you through a logical end of conversation. Yeah, I hope I heard me. It finished that I would send an email. So, yep. okay, then it happened after. Then we are good to go on that side. Okay, awesome. Yeah, this will be a good conversation to get going. So that brings us up to the ARM support. Um, do the do the ARM folks want to want to talk about where they are at this point yeah, and sure. your questions? Yeah. Yeah. So if you see the um, on the Google Doc, let me open it. Uh, Robin, you want to talk about this, or you want me to go through? Uh, hello, Tim. Uh, this is uh, Robin. I'm from ARM. So currently, uh, this is my first time to, to join this meeting. Uh, today, I want to, uh, uh, to to ask some question about uh, ARM initial, initial support to Kubernetes. <clears throat> we want to uh, add ARM support to Kubernetes. So uh, uh, how many gaps are there? So can I share my desktop and uh, show what's, what we have done? Oops, I'm sorry, I clicked on the, the thing scrolled there. There you are now a co-host, yes. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, can, can you see my desktop? It's coming through, I think. Oh. It says you've started sharing, but I'm not, it's still just a dark screen. Okay, the networking is not so good. Oh, there it is. Oh, thank you. So, uh, as you see, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, we have have done a lot of jobs for Kubernetes on ARM platform, and also we have created a, uh, some some conformance test jobs for ARM platform. Uh, please see. The, the the three links here. We can use uh, uh, admin and uh, Corpse to deploy an ARM um, um, conformance test cluster. And uh, please see the te uh, test result uh, here. Uh, we Currently, we have created some jobs such as uh, uh, periodic ARM um, conformance test, uh, uh, conformance test with container D and on uh, AWS and uh, on Packet.net. Also, we we created some jobs uh, to show the result about the uh, uh, kind on ARM platform and uh, uh, integration and the node conformance. So uh, well, we want to know uh, if we want uh, uh, to let the community to announce announce that uh, uh, the Kubernetes has already initial support the ARM. So uh, how many gaps are there? Also, we have discussed uh, about this question with uh, us, with some, some Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes members such as uh, ben, ben the Elder and uh, Dims.
Okay, this is uh, uh, my question. Okay, so this is another area where I feel like the project doesn't have the best of decision making process. From a SIG release perspective, we're generally a trailing indicator of support and I'll say support sort of in air quotes, maybe with a, a lowercase s instead of a capital S. We, we don't have the strongest concept of what it means to support something as a project globally. So from a SIG release perspective, what we try to do is understand what the project's commitment is, how, how broadly folks are committed to making sure something is maintained. We want to avoid Kind of single points of failure or a limited amount of um, contributors behind something and resources so that we know that if something breaks that it will get fixed promptly because that's ultimately what our downstream consumers understand from the word support that if it breaks it will get fixed and and there we get into the kind of how things break things may break because our developers don't understand the platform, for example. I suspect that's less of a case on ARM these days because it's a little more prevalent. But we also, we've been in discussion about some other things between, between hardware architecture variations and operating system variations. There's a lot of diversity and potential systems out there. And any developer in the project could make a code change somewhere that is built on their internal biases, for example, to Linux and x86, or x86-64 even, and certain platform assumptions. So we, we need to make sure that for the platforms we are intending to support, the developers understand generally how not to accidentally break them, what are the quirks or differences on those platforms, and then that there are some key people who understand and watch for these things, that the test coverage is sufficient and that they get quickly fixed. So certainly a first step in all of that, I think, is getting the test grid data there so that people can see it. Um, having a, a board for Signode ARM64, I think, is really important. The, the, the way that I've been pushing on this is to try to get this being discussed at SIGnode specifically and at SIG Architecture because they're one, SIGnode is going to be the, the subject matter expert set of people who could kind of give the, the, the green light or the thumbs up and say like, yeah, we believe that this is, is healthy, it's ready, it's sufficiently supported. And then at the architecture level, that's the first place where I would see things going broadly at, are the key architect sort of people broadly across the project feeling that all of the things for some fuzzy definition of that are present. So I, I would be looking to them from a SIG release perspective to say these things that are in um, they're in test grid, maybe from an informational perspective, are they ready to move towards a, a release blocking criteria? And that takes a little bit bigger conversation. So I think it, it's great that you've had some discussion with, with Dems and Ben. Um, I'm curious if you've, if you've been discussing at Signode with the folks there in their meetings. Robin, yes, uh, we also discuss in the sick note meeting next Monday, next Tuesday. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we will join the signal meeting later. I'm just trying to pull up. Um... The SIG architecture meeting last week was going to talk about some of this architecture stuff and didn't because the the um, the agenda was really full. So I'm just looking to see if that got pushed to a next meeting. It doesn't look like the agenda there has been updated yet. And let me just confirm when their next meeting is.
It's this yeah, week, it's actually. Next Monday. Yeah, there should next be Monday. should be Thursday of this week, July second. Really? Uh, the the calendar gets a little funky. The calendar says every Tuesday, ten a.m. PST. Is is that SIGNODE or SIG Architecture? Is it SIGNODE? SIGNODE, yeah. Okay, that sounds right for SIGNODE. SIG Architecture is every other Thursday at 11 Pacific or 1800 UTC. So let me, um, just a second, I'll paste, I'm pasting this into the Zoom chat, the link for SIG Architecture, and I'll, I'll also link, um, Link it in the meeting minutes here. Should discuss with Sig Arch. And I'm going to say along with Illumos. And there's the, the link there Thursday, July 2nd. So, the, um, over the last month, we've been having some initial discussions with some people from Illumos, which is kind of the, the follow on to Open Solaris. And they're looking to try to figure out how they could get support with Kubernetes and containerization on their platform. So we, we have kind of a, a multi dimensional array between initially Linux and Mac OS and Windows and potentially other operating systems, and then all of the hardware architectures. Are there specific operating systems that you're intending to support at this point beyond Linux? Hi, hi, I'm Howard from um, uh, No, actually we are supporting Linux, uh, only support Linux now. So no other OS, thanks. And that kind of kind of makes sense. We again kind of going back to as a project, we don't have a clear policy. Linux obviously is the first place. I think if something came for a hardware architecture without Linux support, I think that would feel slightly weird at this point. But beyond Linux, the other things start becoming a little more niche and it's it's unclear to what extent we would expect everything to be supported on all platforms. There's been some past discussion about wanting to make Windows for sure a first class citizen and, and have things equally supported. But that also depends on having official stable builds of the OS on the platform. And I don't know the current status of that from Microsoft. I feel like they they've done things in the past, but I don't know where support stands, much less around the, the cloud side of things. So I, I appreciate you coming to us. I think we might be sort of the later part of the required conversations, but it's good for maybe to start here that we can point to the other places and then we also start tracking the conversations. I'm curious to, I'll try to attend the SIG node meeting and I am I need to ping the SIG Arch people to see if they are gonna circle back around to talking about Illumos this week and, and see if they would also t discuss ARM there as well. So I think we can, we can kind of carry the conversation on to the next level and locations and then kind of be cycling back. But I, I think, I would think from what I'm seeing, you're probably getting close to at least being useful to, to possibly have in an, a release informing sort of state. What that would mean for us is we, we try to watch that from a release perspective. And, and if there's issues, we'll, we'll spend some initial time triaging back to the proper owners and, and see like, is this a major issue? Is it an outlier? Are you on track to fix it? Should we hold up the release? But on average, we won't just be starting with, uh oh, this is a, a major thing that we must block the release for. So it's sort of a, a first phase towards that support concept, a, a support soft maybe. But then that becomes a question for the rest of the project and for you, if you wanna drive towards blocking support, to, to be demonstrating that the CI is really comprehensive, that it's basically always green for like the, the periodics that they're running quite regularly. And um, 
because it looked like they're running maybe every was it every couple days looked like i saw four four runs in the last um yeah sort of two weeks maybe although it yeah, it's it's variable the dates on which they run. Maybe that's a question then. Are the are the periodics supposed to run on a timer or are they more manual or what's the trigger? Because they go from the June fifteenth to seventeenth to twenty third to twenty fourth, so it's kinda kinda gappy. Like and, and maybe meta yeah, uh... around that, like maybe we should have some discussion with Signode and us around what is the test plan from your perspective to ensure coverage. Uh, hi, teams. Uh, actually, the test is very stable, but it's wrong in our virtual machine. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the gap is because uh, we do another uh, test on the host. So it's block the internet in VM. So the whole test stopped. So, but um, uh, there is only four tests there, I think now. Uh, but um, before that, the the test is quite stable, and the periodic is uh, is about one day we do one test, yeah. But we can um, make it more frequent. Yeah. Yeah, I think initially daily is potentially okay. Um... The, the underlying stability, like it, it, it's great if you know the test is stable, but again, we need the signal out into the community to know and, and react to issues. So that, that's one of the challenges with federating the tests the way we, we do with Prow. Anybody else on the phone today or on the call on Zoom have thoughts? Um, Lubomir, do you have thoughts from a deployment perspective or others? So in SQL's lifecycle, we are already aware that ARM works with our tools, like uh, COPS, QBIDM. We already know that because we had user reports. Uh, but we highly appreciate this new signal that we are going to get because uh, of course we cannot claim that our tools work if we don't have the test signal. So thank you very much for this effort. Uh, I, uh, something that I mentioned to Tim is that uh, eventually I would like to see a list of all the supported architectures and operating system uh, enumerated as part of each release uh, so that you know people can see the state of the signal, the support status, uh, the overall picture uh, to make things more clear for the users. There are many end users uh, using uh, Kubernetes ARM uh, on ARM in their internal CI in their company. So now it's time to have uh, CI in the community. So earlier, unrelated to this, we were talking about our the artifacts we build and release. I'm guessing that if we shift towards more formal support of this, we would be needing to add ARM variations to our RPM and DEBs, or how? what would Cluster Lifecycle be expecting for artifacts there? That's a good question. I think... Uh the architecture variants will be required. Uh, so yeah, we have to add them. Uh, but I would also uh, recommend a slight rename if we go public publicly with this, that we should not call it initial support because the support was already there because we are already you know, for a couple of years at least producing artifacts for ARM. Uh, we should like focus on uh, announcing this in the lines of, we now have test signal. Uh, so uh, like more stability for the support.
agree. Okay. Any other things that folks want to talk about on this front? I'll I'll take the action item to um to reach out to Sig Arch about the this Arch Distro discussion. If see if we can get it on the agenda for Thursday. Um, I don't know if I have a way specifically to reach out to the ARM folks, but um, I can. Are are y'all on Slack like in in Signode or, or somewhere? If I wanted to to ping you. Yeah, we are on the Slack. Okay, so I'll, I'll reach out to Sigarch and see if this might be something that we can get on the agenda for Thursday and then ping you you all if so, so you know to, to try and attend if possible. Yeah, sure, happy to. Yeah, thanks for coming to us. I think, like, like Lubomir says, I think this would be great to, to be able to announce that we have additional better test signal and for that to lead out into something more than what we've already had for initial support to start formalizing something bigger than that if, if we're ready for it technically. So next on the agenda then is an update on triage party. We've got 10 minutes still. Good morning party people. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, the final PR was merged yesterday evening, I believe, and we just have to do a few updates uh, on our end. Arnaud was here, but he had to drop. Uh, I think the last piece that we're doing is just some DNS tweaking, and then we will be live. So I just wanted to give a quick update on that. That was it for me. Dumb question on my part. Um, nope, not dumb. I've asked dumb questions already. Covered the dumb part. I probably have just missed this discussion, but are we, do we have something tentatively planned like for a doodle or like a time to, to run the actual party? Like I know we've been discussing the, the infra to get the tool ready, but now I'm ready to do it. <laughs> I know, right? Where, where do uh, I show no, up? We we don't have that. That will hopefully come out this week and then will be sent to the uh, release mailing list. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me know if you want to talk about how to facilitate those. Anyone and Yes, I, I can use you. I also want to see, uh, hold on, I just want to see. Gianluca has dropped. So Gianluca, if you're watching the recording, I did not forget you and I do owe you a demo. And thank you, Carlos. I will put a shirt in the mail to you. I was really hoping Taylor would have stayed on because I wanted to rib him for wearing a Dodgers hat. Why, why is he getting the special shirt we don't? <laughs> Limited edition? Uh, I'll bring more for the class next time, I promise. <laughs> I was going to get some. The, the, so my name is relatively unique in English. Like there's not that many Tims, but somehow on the Kubernetes project, there are a ton of Tims. So I was, I was gonna get some shirts made that were a SIG Tim shirt for KubeCon, but I don't think we're ever gonna physically see each other anytime soon. So that the SIG Tim is still stuck in the formation phases. I wanna Thank bring some, some good news, um, I heard. China has started injected uh, the COVID-19 vaccine from yesterday. So we'll see each other soon. That is yeah, great. I'm hopeful. I'm, yes. I'm, in, in my country right now, things are increasingly out of control, but I'm hopeful that science prevails. Yeah, I'm in uh, Bay Area, so cheers. Yeah, Thank you people all from. I have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we've we've got people from all over the planet and our, our SIG updates and things coming up at the middle of middle end of August for KubeCon virtual EU is something we'll want to make sure we're getting recorded. I forget who all had signed up for those. I know we've got it somewhere in the minutes and um 
Stephen is also on top of that, I think. But um, if you, somebody, people on the call were the ones who are going to do our, our SIG sessions for KubeCon, you should have gotten some notification, I think, this week about pre-recording. I'd seen some chatter that those were going out. I haven't seen it, like the specific details on what's being requested, but there's some something that you, you're supposed to do to record and upload your video ahead of time just to make sure that things work. And then um, I'm actually kind of partly attending this week the Open Source Summit North America, which is a Linux Foundation um, conference. And it's my first time in a virtual event. And it's unusual. It's different. I, I'm curious how KubeCon is going to go, but hopefully we'll, we'll pragmatically figure out how to, how to make it work. But having the presentation pre-recorded assures there's no technical glitches and then beyond that how we collaborate on the virtual platform together in the moment it's going to be different than in real life but we will we'll figure it out as it goes well we have six minutes left is there anything else that folks want to talk about today or shall we call it a meeting All right, not hearing anything. Okay. Well, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and we will see you next week for the release engineering call the week after again for SIG release and, and hopefully for the ARM folks, we can, some of us will see you at SIG Arch and or SIG node meetings in the, the coming week too. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thanks all. Bye all. Thank you. Bye-bye.